Let's just take a moment in prayer just to prepare our hearts. Father God, we, we are weak, Lord, but you are strong. You are mighty. You who are glorious, Lord, and amazing. Lord, we gather together only because of you, only because of your Son, the Lord Jesus. There is no other reason that we would gather together this day, Lord. You change our lives. You transform us. And you are sovereign. Lord, thank you for choosing us as your people. We are so grateful. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we continue our look at Isaiah, uh, I wonder, has people been reading Isaiah at home, preparing some uh, study time in it? Because it's really important, because it's a massive book. And there is so much to understand in it. We're in chapter 14, and we're going to read the passage from uh, 1 to 11 uh, in a moment. But as we read, I want you to be thinking about that future time. That future time when we, as God's people, will be in God's place, under God's rule, and where he will have dealt with the world. He would have dealt with sin and wickedness, and he will rule without rebellion. So let's have a look at chapter 14. The Lord will have compassion on Jacob. Once again, he will choose Israel and will settle them in their own land. Foreigners will join them and unite with the descendants descendants of Jacob. Nations will take them and bring them to their own place. And Israel will take possession of the nations and make them male and female servants in the Lord's land. They will make captives of their captors and rule over their oppressors. On the day the Lord gives you relief from your suffering and turmoil and from the harsh labor forced on you, you will take up this taunt against the king of Babylon. How the oppressor has come to an end. How his fury has ended. The Lord has broken the rod of the wicked, the scepter of the rulers, which in anger struck down peoples with unceasing blows and in fury subdued nations with relentless aggression. All the lands are at rest and at peace. They break into singing. Even the junipers and the cedars of Lebanon gloat over you and say, now that you have been laid low, no one comes to cut us down. The realm of the dead below is all astir. To meet you at your coming, it rouses the spirits of the departed to greet you. All those who were leaders in the world, it makes them rise from their thrones. All those who were kings over the nations, they will all respond. They will say to you, you also have become weak as we are. You have become like us. All your pomp has been brought down to the grave along with the noise of your harps. Maggots are spread out beneath you and worms cover you. May God bless his holy word. As we look at this, these verses, in, chapters, in chapter 14, verses 1 and 2, describes the fate of the Israelite people after the destruction of their captors. The nation of Babylon. This is Isaiah speaking about a future time. The Lord will have compassion on Israel, them and will choose them as his people once more. God will return the people of Israel to the promised land. Some Gentiles from Babylon will come with them and will become slaves to the Israelites. This will be a reversal of the status of God's people from captives to captors over those who had previously oppressed them. 
From 14.3, you see that Isaiah's prophecy about Babylon included essential information. The people of Israel will one day be returned to their land. After their exile in Babylon, they will begin a new era as a free people in their own land under the Lord. This will begin with the defeat of the city-state and nation of Babylon. The prophet Isaiah is about to give that future remnant of Israel a specific task. They should only take it up after the Lord has given them rest from their slavery to Babylon. You see, this verse reveals that Israel's years in Babylon were full of pain, turmoil, and hard service. In that way, the captivity in Babylon was like their years as slaves in Egypt. Once again, the Lord will free his people and bring them to the promised land. Speaking on behalf of the Lord, Isaiah now commands the people of Israel to celebrate the death of the king of Babylon. He is instructing them to mock the king using something known as a taunt song. The Lord will have completely obliterated the city of Babylon at this point and freed his people. He now calls upon Israel to openly mock the king who oppressed them for so many years. The song itself is highly structured and is said to be one of the best examples of Hebrew poetry in the Bible. It takes the form of a funeral dirge, but mocks Babylon's king by turning that dirge from a eulogy into ridicule. It begins by stating that the oppressor has died. With his passing, this man's disobedient rage has also ended. You see, no matter how powerful a tyrant is, no matter how powerful a person might become in this life, human lives always end. There will be an end to the anger that propelled a powerful person to do evil against so many people. Human tyrants, no matter how evil, are short-lived tools in the hand of an eternal and endlessly powerful God. If we believe that the Lord is good, if we believe that he is just and all-powerful, then we know that even the most powerful human beings are under his authority, and their time will come to an end. It is a long poem or song which begins with a joyful celebration over what the Lord has done. You see, it's the Lord himself who has defeated this king. After declaring that the oppression and fury of this ruler's reign has finally been destroyed, the people give all the credit to the Lord. He is the one who has broken the staff of the wicked and the scepter of the rulers. The staff and scepter were symbols of a king's authority and power. To break these objects, an enemy would need to advance and attack past every defense and all the way into the throne room of the king himself. And at that point, the king would be thoroughly defeated. We see the same kind of language being used in Psalm 2. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron and you will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. 
serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Kiss his son or he will be angry and your, your way will lead to your destruction for his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. We must remember that the Lord is doing the work of defeating his enemies. When he breaks the staff of the wicked and the scepter of the rulers, he doesn't leave us kingless. We are not autonomous to do as we please. The Lord himself has went in to the very throne room of the enemy and thoroughly defeated the king. You see, warfare in the ancient Near East was brutal. The kings of the dominant powers of Assyria and Babylon took that brutality to another level. They ruled by fear and intimidation. These kings demanded absolute submission and loyalty from their own people, as well as from conquered kings and nations. Enemies were slaughtered in massive numbers. Headless bodies were sometimes stacked high at the gates of cities as a warning. Children were killed in front of parents. Women who were allowed to survive were assaulted to further humiliate and divide the beaten people. Many survivors were deported to other lands to keep uprisings and rebellion to a minimum. It was a cruel and terrifying time to be alive. And if we remember what Rod was talking about last week, does it sound familiar? You see, we often look back and think, I'm just thankful it's not like that today. But the truth is, the same issue that was at play then is at play now. And the problem is human sin and rebellion to God. <coughs> it's no wonder Isaiah reports that at some future date, after the king of Babylon has finally been defeated, the people of Israel will sing this taunt song about him. They will celebrate the Lord's victory over the king's evil reign. This reign of unrelenting persecution and fury will end. I wonder what you think we do on a Sunday morning. I wonder what you think we've just done as we've sang praises to God. What does that look like to the enemy world, to the people who are opposed to Christ? How, how much do they see it as a taunt against them. You see, we celebrate the Lord's victory over evil and sin. Every Sunday, we sing songs of praise and worship to him. We celebrate the Lord's victory over the king, the evil king of this world's reign. You see, this reign of unrelenting persecution, persecution and fury will end for Israel, just as it will end here and now, in our time. When the Lord returns, ultimately, it will be dealt with. The mood calls to mind historical moments such as the end of World War II, when Adolf Hitler was finally defeated. He too oppressed the Jewish people nearly to extinction. The celebration at the Jewish people's return from Babylon over the defeat of Babylon's king will reach similar heights. The Lord will never allow evil to reign forever. And I think that's a message we all really need to hear this morning. Because as we look around us, we could be forgiven for wondering about that message. We seem to be surrounded by evil, by wickedness, by war. But the Lord will never allow evil to reign forever. 
You see, it takes a truly terrible person whose death makes the world breathe more freely. I don't think there's anybody here today who would enjoy the thought of our death bringing joy to others. Only a heinous legacy would cause masses of people to break into song, celebrating the end of your life. But that is the case with the king of Babylon. Instead of official mourning or genuine sadness, the world breaks into song to celebrate that evil man has died. Isaiah regularly shows God's people singing in joy after being delivered from their enemies. Music was an integral part of Israelite culture, the same as it is for us today. Israel, uh, Isaiah has written that the people of the earth would break into song at the news of the death of the king of Babylon. Now he adds that nature will also rejoice at the man's death. Specifically, Isaiah mentioned trees, the cypresses and the cedar trees of Lebanon will rejoice at this news. The great trees of Lebanon were valued highly in the ancient Near East. These were used to build temples, palaces and other important structures. Taking possession of those forests of Lebanon or receiving timber as a tribute from lesser kings was a show of power for a ruler. It was one more piece of evidence of dominance over the land. The rule of the kings of Assyria and Babylon was nearly all powerful. These, were, uh, these ancient rulers were continually cutting down cedars from Lebanon and having them shipped wherever their next building project was taking place. As a result, the great forests were apparently being drastically reduced because of these evil men being in power. The death of the king of Babylon would bring the rest to the trees of Babylon. The woodcutters would stop arriving and cut down one tree after another. The Lord calls for his people to have dominion over the earth while also caring for it. In a fascinating passage in Deuteronomy, the Lord forbid the Israelites from cutting down certain trees to use for building a siege during wartime. You shall not destroy its trees by wielding an axe against them. You may eat from them, but you shall not cut them down. Are the trees in the field human that they should be besieged by you? Only the trees that you know are not trees for food you may destroy and cut down that you may build siege works against the city that makes war with you until it falls. That's Deuteronomy chapter 20, verses 19 and 20. You see, Isaiah's description of the aftermath of the death of the king of Babylon moves from celebration on earth to his reception in the place of the dead. This place is referred to as Sheol. This poetic imagery isn't meant to be a precise, analytical, theologically nuanced representation of the afterlife. Instead, Isaiah pictures the place of the dead as it may have been imagined to his audience at that time of writing. The dead were thought to occupy a similar level of status in the grave as they did during their lives on earth. He is picturing the dead kings of the nations as occupying thrones as they did in life. Isaiah will turn that idea on its head. This place of the dead is stirred up at the news that the king, the evil king of Babylon, will be arriving there. Sheol, Sheol rouses the spirits of the dead, leaders of the world, to greet the fallen king. They are pictured as rising from their thrones as he enters, as if these leaders still had places of honour and authority. Sheol was the name given during this era for the place of the dead. This was where the spirits of those who departed would dwell. Isaiah is not giving precise language of what really occurs and what it really looks like. Rather, he is poetically imagining a scene where the king of Babylon is further humbled even after he has died. It is a complete victory that the Lord has over Babylon. The song describes the stir in the grave at the news that the king will be arriving because he's died on earth. 
the spirit of the dead kings will rise from their thrones to greet him. In a traditional funeral dirge of the day, they would be rising to give the king of Babylon honor. In this song, however, they rise to mock the new member of their company. The departed kings of the world point out to the dead tyrant that he is now as weak as they are. He is no greater than them. During his life, the king of Babylon may have conquered and killed some of those greeting him. Now he has no power or authority over him, over them. He is no threat to them. He is just another dead soul. And as we think about powerful people, that's their end. When they come to their end, they are like any other. They come under the judgment of God. No one escapes the judgment of God. The living and the dead will all face Christ. This once powerful ruler has been defeated and killed by the Lord God of Israel. This taunting song is a mockery of a normal funeral. Isaiah shows that this king will not be honored, even in the afterlife, by those who have died before him. They observe that his pomp and the sound of his harps are brought down to show. In other words, all the royal finery and symbols of power have been stripped away. The once feared king is no longer important or significant. There is no reason to fear this man, for he is just that, a powerless husk of the former ruler. He is merely another dead soul whose body will feed worms and bacteria. This is meant to show just how powerless the king of Babylon has truly become. How his reign of terror is utterly complete and ended. And how his body will rot in the ground in the way of every other person who has gone before him. He is neither powerful nor unique, but simply a man whose time is done. Now it's important to understand what's happening at the time of Isaiah. And that this king of Babylon is a real historical figure. But you'll also be forgiven for asking, okay, that happened then. How does it affect my life today? Well, like we were telling the kids, God does not abandon his people. He will always return for us. Just in time and time again, the Lord chose Israel and returned for them and took them out of captivity. He delivered them time and time again. He will deliver us. He has delivered us. And he is delivering us. We are not alone in this world. You have an all-powerful God who could lay low the king of Babylon. And he is on your side. In scripture, Babylon is symbolic of human defiance and rebellion against God. There is a historic Babylon and a symbolic Babylon. When we speak about the Babylon that we are facing, we're talking about the world. We're talking about the prince and the powers of this world. We're talking about the evil and wickedness and sin of this world. We're talking about rebellion in this world. Salvation and judgment are two sides of the same coin. We receive salvation only through judgment. As believers, you have been saved only because the Lord judged the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross in your place. His judgment was necessary in order for us to be saved. 
just as the Lord's judgment on this world is necessary for his people to have a place that is secure and free of sin. The, one of the primary purposes of destroying evil is to safeguard and secure a place for the Lord's people. We are on the victory side versus the wicked ruler of Babylon. We talk about a global peace. In fact, it was one of the uh, things put forward uh, during the children's talk as a hope for the future. That global peace can only come when the Lord returns and destroys his enemies. The Lord will not compromise with sin and wickedness. Victory comes through the Lord judging and defeating the world. So you, you have a, there's a question for you. Are you on the victory side today? Yeah? Because if you're on the victory side, you have nothing to fear about the future. Doesn't mean life's going to be easy. Because as you see for the Lord's people at this time, they had to labor. They would be delivered for that. In this life, we are here to labor for the Lord. Yeah, we have things in our lives that we like to do. And there's nothing wrong with enjoying our lives here. So long as it doesn't take a greater importance than our lives with the Lord. We don't live for this world, but we live for the next. And the only people that really know if you're living your life for Christ or for yourself is you. <coughs> Other people can look in and they can make judgments, but at the end of the day, they don't know. The Lord knows and you know. So a time will come when the Lord will return and you'll come face to face with him. And if you are his, you are always his. You won't lose your salvation. But you will have to give an account. You will have to speak to him and, and tell him what you have been doing for him. And I must admit, that concerns me. Because I could always do more for Christ. I can make a big deal about being busy for the Lord. I can rhyme off lists of things. But does it measure up to what he's done for me? Does it measure up to what he's done for you? Only you know that. Only, knew, only you know that if you are living your life sold out for Christ if you're putting him first in your life, if the other things you're doing is for him and for his glory, if it impacts this world for Jesus, if it impacts his kingdom, or if it has no eternal value whatsoever, because everything will go through the refiner's fire. And only the things that have eternal significance will make it through. Why labor for the things that will be burned up instead of laboring for the things that matter? I want to assure you today that like the Lord returning and remembering Israel and taking them from captivity, putting them back in his promised land, we are a, a, a people of exile living in this world today who are promised to be in the promised land to come. And he will return and he will take us there. Think about the things that you have in your lives and ask the question, will this be there?
Will it make it into that new creation? Will the Lord count it as a worthy time spent? That's something for each of us to think about. Maybe let us try and live our lives with an eternal perspective as we look to that time when Jesus returns. How different would our lives be if that was the reality of our lives? Let's pray. Father God, we give thanks to you, the giver of life, because you, Lord, you alone are the deliverer. You alone took an enemy people and made them your family. You alone, Lord, are the deliverer of that people. And one day, Lord, we will be with you in your very presence. And Lord, not, not, just, not just in heaven, Lord, but in that new creation, when you have swept away sin and death and pain and suffering, and you've created a place of peace where we can be your people and you will be our God. Lord, help us to be transformed by that truth that a time is coming when the things of this world will be burned up. So let us love, live and love our eternal King. So that when we're in your place, under your rule, as your people, we can stand before you knowing that we gave everything to the one who gave everything for us. Bless us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.